that of uh, diseases. Uh, she's PhD in social history, also for, given by the uh, University of Sao Paulo. And there, her focus was in the history of communication of science, uh, basically scientific journals. And so she's a, a researcher at the University of Campinas. She, I don't know if now you're visiting professor at Simon Fraser. No, I she was. was <laughs> you were? Okay. And then now she's working at this new decree at Unicampi. And she's going to talk about how to portray women in science, I guess, in yes. different media. Thank you, Germain. Thank you. So thank you so much for the invitation to having me here. Um, I already will uh, apologize for my English. I think it's a bit rusty right now because I, I went to Canada, and but I'm back for uh, a year already. So I apologize if my English is a little rusty. Um, so today I am a science communicator. I work at uh, University of Campinas, and I'm, I'll talk about um, the importance of communicating science. And my my work has been focused on Brazilian science and how we should, as science communicators, value Brazilian science in general. And of course, my role here today is also to talk about women in science. And this is my daily work, actually. This is my daily concern. Uh, so I teach uh, um, science journalism at Unicamp. We have a course that it's um, turning 20 years old this year. And I was the first, uh, I, I was graduated from the first group, the first year this course was offered in 1999. So, and today I teach at this course. So this gives you uh, um, a tip of my age. Um, so I'll start a little bit with the map of internet users in Brazil. So we have a sense how Brazilians are using the internet. And we have around 75% of Brazilians use, they have access to internet, uh, which is pretty amazing, but we have always to keep in mind that still a quarter of Brazilians don't have access to internet. 97% um, of internet users do it on the phone, the access is through the phone, the mobile. And 73% of internet users access social media. So I do understand that some people still have some bias against social media. They may think that it's very informal, that it's useless, but we know, and every year we know how important social media is. Yeah, it's electing presidents all over the world. Uh, for the good or for the bad, you choose. Um, but we know how important it is. So not talking about social media nowadays, it's insane. We, we have to talk about it. But we have a very diverse map in, of Brazil here, where the darkest blue is the uh, higher speed access to internet. And the lighter the white here shows the states in Brazil with lower uh, speed of internet. So we need to face all the time how, um, how um, different is our, our country. And among the social media, we have here how Brazilians are using them, and we have WhatsApp at the top and Facebook on second place. So um, we, we have to do something about it because the enterprise, the politicians, they already know that. But we scientists, we, we're still using WhatsApp maybe for a familiar purpose or for groups, um, for academy groups, meetings, but we need to spread news and information using WhatsApp as well. We need to do that. 
uh, Facebook as well. If you think that Twitter is the most used social media among uh, scientists, not in Brazil. This works for Europeans and for Americans, maybe Canadians, but not in, in Latin America. We use very little, okay? Um, this is not saying that you shouldn't use Twitter. Twitter is nowadays, I think, if you want to know what is going on uh, in the world on uh, life speed, you should use uh, Twitter. But uh, do not undervaluate the other two social media. Uh, here we, we conducted a survey among academics in four universities, and this we have the results only for the two Brazilian universities, was my university, State University of Campinas, and Federal University of Alagoas in the Northeast, and they had pretty much the same type of use. So we have among uh, scholars, 8% use Twitter academically, so professionally. And it's still, ResearchGate is a very academic social media, so of course they are using academically. But they are um, informing that WhatsApp and Facebook are well used or are very used academically. So this is very important, that we should think about social media as a very powerful communication tool. So um, if you ever try to read a paper on your mobile, on your cell phone, um, in Brazil, uh, I don't know, maybe it depends on the journal you're, you're uh, selecting to, to read, but if you try reading um, paper in any Brazilian journals, like uh, Chemi uh, Chimica Nova, which belongs to the Brazilian Society of Chemistry. And this is just one example. I could have taken any other Brazilian journal from Cielo, for example. Um, you have a PDF format. And it's really annoying to try reading paper on your phone. But if you get um, a prestigious international commercial journal. They know how important it is to have um, an adapted uh, version of your paper so you can read it quite well on your phone. Why not? Why I'm using, um, I'm here talking about papers and journals? Because I'll start my talk about how invisible Brazilian science is for the media. And I found that, I found out that some years ago, around uh, 2010, I started my PhD and my, my uh, goal was to research nature and science journals, two of the most prestigious international journals in the world. And I was very much interested about how much they invest in science communication, how much they uh, work with journalists, and they spread their news to thousands of journalists uh, worldwide. So I thought, is it because they are prestigious, or they are prestigious because they get visibility? So I don't have an easy answer for that, but certainly visibility is very important to get uh, prestigious, right? So I, since 2010, I started um, to, to analyze journals and their strategies to spread and to disseminate their papers. So um, I, I analyzed Folha de São Paulo, which is one of the most important and biggest uh, newspapers in Brazil. And during uh, a timeline, the, between five years um, lifespan, I analyzed all the science news Folia was um, uh, publishing. And around 30% of all science news are based on papers of some kind of journal. 
and half of it, only about five journals. Would you like to try to guess which five papers are? Uh, five journals, science, nature, PNAS, New England Journal of Medicine, and PLOS One. Okay? Among those five journals, four are North American, yeah? are from the, the States, four. One from England. So it's amazing how they, uh, um, they, they form a kind of uh, oligopolio yeah? where they dominate the news. So they are the most prestigious ones. And how many from 280, 278 journals I identify in five years in Folha, only four were Brazilian, okay? Only four uh, journals. And just one, which was from the uh, eyes of the, the Brazilian Academy of Science, was the only one really uh, talking about a paper published in, in this important journal. The other three journals were there just to mention how bad Brazilian science was, uh, how difficult the situation was, or uh, plagiarism cases. So only to, to say bad things about Brazilian journals. So I start dedicating my, um, um, my activity as a science communicator to transform that image of Brazilian science. So a lot of things have changed since 2010. Uh, now if you go to Facebook or Twitter or even Instagram, starting a little bit, you see efforts of Brazilian journals um, doing uh, communication, uh, communicating their editions or papers or starting to talk with their readers. And here we have a gender um, uh, journal, Pagu, from Unicamp. Some others, this is from uh, Phil Cruz in Rio, the others from, uh, from USP, uh, Journal of Medicine, this is from the, the Brazilian Chemical Society, and this is from Cielo, which is a repository, of, an in indexing of uh, Brazilian and other countries also from Latin America. And you see here the number of followers, K as for thousands, right? 18,000 for, for, from Federal University of Santa Catarina, uh, which is pretty good, uh, 22,000. And here you have some, um, some English commercial or open access uh, prestigious journals. So you see the numbers. This is only for Facebook. Of course, they are in English, so they, they can reach more people than ours. But it's a very good start. Um, and I've, I have shown uh, editors and authors that the blue, uh, the blue bar here represents the month, uh, the access of a specific paper when you spread the news on social media. So you have um, a peak of access, and here is the average access before going to social media. So what you see, and is with some exceptions, in general is when you go to social media, you get more visibility and more chances to be read. And of course, to be cited one day. So it's very important to be in the news, very important to be on social media, because of course, if you don't know something, how can you cite this? How can you know that, that this is relevant or not? So um, we have interviewed some editors of uh, Brazilian journals, and they have reported us that when they start doing um, communication on social media, they, they report having more access, they, um, the journals is more access, they have more chances to get 
uh, better peer review uh, referees, right? Um, and they could reach uh, a wider public. So let's say they don't want to get the general public. It's okay. But maybe a journal about chemistry may interest a nurse or a doctor or a pharmaceutical or someone from a different field, not specifically that one. So social media is also a good chance to rethink about the role of uh, a journal. So um, I'll start talking about Brazilian science because we think that we do a lot and that people should know about that and it's relevant enough, but it's not. Now, everything has changed. If you read Folha de São Paulo, or Estadão, or Globo, other newspapers, or if you go to even magazines, like weekly magazines as Veja or other ones, you may find news about Brazilian science, and this is, this is very good. Um, so our Brazilian science is still lacks more visibility because, of course, we all know that we are in the middle of a war against science, a war against public institutions. So it's, I'm, I'm happy to know that now my colleagues realize that science communication should be strategic for all of us. It's about survival, right? It's about justifying how important we are for society. And then we get the women scientists that is still a minority, as Marsha pointed. And I belong to one of the top universities in Latin America. And my university, um, we may think that probably half half professors are women. But at my university, 33% of professors are women a third. And if you think that in humanities uh, it's easier because they are more um, composed by women, naturally more women in humanities, this is still not true. Um, I had to write a series of reports last year for uh, Unicamp. Uh, our rector asked me to do that and I did it happily but critically <laughs> because I, I, I had to go through the numbers and I, I was shocked to see that even in biology, my house, we weren't majority there. Okay, so I think, of course, we are in a physics um, institute here, but we should see how serious it still is. And here I, I got some um, faces of women scientists that are very good communicators, and probably you know all of them or a majority of them. And it's amazing that when they get a very important position, as Masha uh, was telling us, you should, you should go for it and, and, and take advantage from this. And I think Elena Nader, uh, now the vice president of the Brazilian Academy of Science, but she used to be the president of the Brazilian Society for the Advancement of Science. Um, you should go for it and try changing and, um, um, and building the way for other women to come up. I think this is a very important action to do. That's why I always tell my students, my science uh, journalist students, that we have a very important role because if we are the ones who are uh, making this dialogue with society, yeah, we are between the moderators, between science and society, we, should, we, have, uh, we have to show a more varied um, profession as a more varied science as possible. And this includes women and color and race and regions in Brazil. Again, uh, Marcia was talking about this during the break. And I used to be the editor of Ciencia e Cultura. It's a magazine from SBPC, SBPC 
founded in 1949 by a group of men. So I was the editor in 2008 to 2016. And my concern was always um, to get a coordinator, because we have a leading coordinator of uh, scientific papers in the magazine. I was always concerned, no, we had a man. We need a woman now. And no, this is from Sao Paulo. We need someone from the north, someone from the northeast, someone from the south. And this has to be a daily concern. When we organize meetings, when we organize groups, because we are there to, to decide how the future will be. So we need to take a leading role on all that. That's why I'm telling you that um, I'm not only here today talking about the importance of uh, communicating about women uh, in science. So uh, some data about uh, how researchers, women researchers and scientists appear in the news. Uh, around 49%, I don't know much if this number is uh, a current number, but as far as I know, we are almost reaching half. All researchers uh, are women in Brazil, so 49%. So there is an advantage com in comparison to other countries. Uh, but it's still, when we go to science, how the media covers science, we are a minority. Okay? Uh, there is a low presence of scientists on TV, so it's the main media of Brazilians. So around 0.8% of all the program of TV was about science, so science is already a minority in the news. And among those, women were a complete minority. So the majority is white male scientists wearing white coat working in labs. It seems that it's a, a, a view of an old, fantastic view of scientists, a stereotype vision of scientists that is still very current and very uh, present. Although the majority of science communicators are women, journalists, naturally, uh, it's, it's an area full of women. But still, we are not committed to show that women um, are present or should be more present in science. And what is interesting when you go to social media is that women science communicators are very active on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter. On YouTube, though, we are a minority. Okay? Why is that? Let me try to show... Oh, oops, oops. Let me just see if I have the data here. No, it's somewhere. OK. We're still a minority on YouTube. Oh, OK, I have a slide about YouTube. And I'll share the reason later. So we are a majority on, uh, among science communicators. But when you get the prizes, so the laureates of science journalism or science um, International, this is from UNESCO, and this is the from CNPK, CNPK. We have among uh, 39 laureates, eight women. And from UNESCO, among 71 laureates, only 5%, 6% are women. So again, we get it's not lack of talent, but there is something there. Probably if we get the composition of the committees who decide who is going to be the winner, we'll have a chance to understand a little bit better why we don't have more women there. So I start with this movement. I used to work in Canada, in Vancouver, and we, did a, we mapped science communicators on social media. And it was 
a very nice surprise to find a lot of women engaged um, in the gen gender issue. So what those women scientists are doing, they're not only communicating their science, but they're advocating for women in power, empowerment in science, which is amazing to see that. It's very nice to see that. And very creative. So we have uh, Nina Draw Scientist. So she, um, she uh, published draws of women scientists on a daily basis. It's very nice. So it's a way to provide more visibility for women. Uh, this, is, um, this is all from Instagram, okay? Uh, super women, so always sharing common women scientists and their daily work, which is very nice. Samantha Yamin uh, was a PhD student from University of Toronto. She's very popular. Uh, she's a, a celebrity among uh, science communicators. Very young, 35,000 um, followers. And I'll tell you her story in the next slide, what happened. And here, uh, Mary Scientist, she, she does those amazing uh, drawing of cells. And not surprising, they're all biologists. <laughs> so we need more physicists and chemists and engineers and all sorts of, but biologists, they are very active uh, on social media. And I would say that among men, phys physicists are very active on, on science communication as well. So women need to, to stand up and open an Instagram account. Look how amazing is this. This is a science makeup. Right? So, using makeup and talking about science. So, Samantha, um, she got uh, severe criticism on uh, Science Magazine two years ago? No, last year, 2018. Why I don't use Instagram for science outreach? This was written by a colleague a women colleague from University of Toronto of Samantha. And she was criticizing Samantha for being a woman on Instagram, doing selfie, selfies, um, being beautiful if she wants to be beautiful. And she said that this is not a good strategy uh, to empower new generation because she's, she was being exactly what to think wants us to be beautiful in a lab. Fortunately, all science communicators community went against Megan and the uh, science magazine apologized for not um, taking a chance to know Samantha's opinion and Samantha had a, an amazing chance to write a response in science. And the answer was amazing because all communicators fought for Samantha and to say, if you're not happy with this type of science communicator, you should do something else. But science communication is very important for all of us. And Samantha is very successful in what she does. So, and this is in Canada, so we're not, and this is a white girl from University of Toronto in Canada. So you may imagine how it would be if it's a different uh, country, a different language, a different color, a different class, so things get worse. Here I brought some women science communicators or journalists who communicate about science, uh, podcasters, which I strongly recommend all of them. And podcast itself is an amazing media that is a multitask media. 
you may uh, do an experiment, a boring experiment, and listen to your podcast. You may be in the subway, in the bus stop, in a doctor um, waiting room, or wherever you want to be, and listen to those amazing podcasts. Uh, Beatriz and Sara are our ex-students, so I'm very honored to present you to 37 Degrees, which is a very good podcast about science. Uh, Mamilos is an amazing feminist, but not only feminist. It, it means that nowadays we have to be. I think we don't have any other choice. So it's an amazing listen to it. And it's very aggressive, let's say, for some people, the name, right? Mm -hmm. Nipples. But it's amazing. It's really an amazing uh, podcast. and talks about climate change, about agrotoxics, and about things that are really interesting for us scientists. Dragon's oxygen, you know, it's oxygen is from our lab as well, and directed by a woman researcher, and those from uh, women in engineers. So you see, it can be a very powerful tool to spread or to communicate with society about science or about gender or both things. And here I bring some data about YouTube that I told you that except for YouTube, we are majority of science communicators on social media. And here I brought the example of um, two, two programs. This is from Manual do Mundo. It's, I think it, it's one, I think it's the most popular uh, program on YouTube about science or science-related topics. And it's formed by a couple. And it's amazing that sometimes only he is the one, Iberé is the one who is leading the, the program, and sometimes she is the one leading the program. Um, and it's awful to see the feedback from viewers. Um, and here's some data. Majority of videos are presented by men in science communication. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Yes, okay. Um, we are an absolute minority on videos. It seems that we are more exposed. When you, you film, you are more exposed. And the reactions are awful. So women get more comments per view, higher proportion of sexist or sexual appearance, hostile, critical, negative commentaries. And I, I provided just this example. This is just a simple video explaining how uh, the sewer works. How do we clean a sewer? How do we treat the sewer into pure water? No politics, ideological content so far. But if you get, this is from this week, we have, uh, look, almost one, okay, more than half a million um, views, this video. So it's very powerful. Video is a very powerful tool. When you go through the comments, do it later. I recommend. It's shocking. Mostly male comments. So they're very active on YouTube. They post a lot of comments. And most of them are ridiculous. It's like, have you, have you taken the chance to watch the whole video or are you just there attacking women? And it seems that they're just attacking women. It's, it's awful. It's, it's, so to be a science communicator, a female science communicator on YouTube, you must have guts to really to process all that because you really, um, how do we say that? You, you, you break the bubble, right? Because it's very easy when you are talking to people from your community. But when you break, yeah, is it this? What is the break the bubble or, okay. 
So when you talk to people that are really not from your community, then it's trouble. So, and this is also another science communicator. And you see here, um, this is um, Sabrina Fernandes. And she has a blog called, um, a vlog called uh, Tesi Onzi. And she talks about uh, humanities, um, humanities, politics, issues, and you know that nowadays talking about left, uh, talking about Marxism, <laughs> really, uh, you should be very brave, right? And it's amazing. But her comments are very, very nice. So do this exercise and try imagining how um, you should try to be brave to do some things. So being a science communicator uh, is not easy at all. So two analyses here, um, presence of women in STEM videos, almost 400 videos, 8% eight, 8 were made by women. And in Brazil, this research, uh, we got 23% of women YouTubers. So it's still a very difficult ground for science communicators. And here's some uh, important initiatives where we could provide more visibility for women scientists in Brazil. And we have to recognize that Serra Pilheira Institute is doing an amazing job from um, providing support, financial support for science communication, very creative uh, projects. And here we have one of them, which is scientists that you must know. And believe me, there are lots of women there already. And it's, yeah, it's not over yet. Uh, they are financing this gender and number uh, project, which is to give, provide more visibility to statistics, uh, gender related. Very, very interesting. Um, this also uh, Olabi project also uh, technologies to, to transform society and you have an imp women empowerment uh, projects. And here you have the di distribution by gender per area uh, for projects that Serra Pilheira got uh, proposals. And we almost have not half but we're getting there with proposals. But if Serra Pileira has this data here, it means that they are worried about that. So this is very good when you have data. It means that someone is concerned. Okay, here is just, um, I don't want to, to go through very much. I'll, I'll pass that. I'll just provide some, Everything is not in the right place, but it's okay. I'll try one more. Uh, reasons to use social media. So I strongly recommend you to do, to engage more on social media. And engage doesn't mean uh, become a science communicator, but become, becoming a communicator facilitator, it's the key, I think. I, I don't think everybody is keen to be a science communicator, but you can facilitate communication with public and the media. So some of the reasons, share information, get more visibility, to provide access, to get more international, to do marketing of your group, of your field, of your institution, to communicate science to a broader public, to establish collaboration network. It's very important to get visible on social media. Uh, it's amazing how people are getting in touch with each other through social media in non-traditional ways. Yeah, so I strongly recommend. Uh, motivate young generation to science career, influence public policy. And I think this is one of the most important ones. And we know nowadays that we are under attack having to justify all the time how important and why 
what we are doing with public money, I think science communication is a good way to, to restart this. Uh -huh. Promote trust in science. Um, so just few tips, just in case you want to know where should I start. So I have here um, on this side something that is more academically, um, there is an advantage of communicating among peers. You would use Mendeley and Twitter. Uh, on Twitter is very interesting because there is um, an analysis that shows that before having a thousand followers on Twitter, you're not able to break the bubble. If you have less than 1,000 followers on Twitter, you're able only to talk to peers, to your community, with your close surroundings. But if you persist and if you build up your social media, then you're able to be a small influencer. Uh, blogs and YouTube, I'll put between them because you can do both. You can have a blog and talk to peers or to a wider public. YouTube is the same. And here are their social media. And I put here Wikipedia logo to remind us how important it is to contribute to added content on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is probably the most popular <laughs> site that we have is our encyclopedia, right? Try to take a look on how women scientists are represented there. Is it right? Is it enough? Shouldn't we be doing something to, to contribute, to change that image? Because nowadays, if you Google something, probably Wikipedia will be the first or the second site. So it's very important to check content there and contribute. And sometimes some groups are doing like a um, um, marathon of Wikipedia. During one week, everybody starts writing uh, content to improve. For example, I am from nanotechnology, and I want to improve the content about nanotechnology research in Portuguese, because probably in English is already there, but not in Portuguese. So very important social media. So just to finish, I'll start, stop with this one. Simple strategies on social media. Uh, publish on open <laughs> access journals. I think as scientists, well, physicists are more um, keen to publishing on open access, but not all fields do that. I personally try always to publish on open access. If we want people to get access to what we are publishing, what we are analyzing, uh, concluding, this information should be available for everyone, right? So I think it's very important. If you want to share something on social media, it must be on open access. Otherwise, people won't have access to it. Include link with DOI, right? The Digital Object Identifier is a good way to track how people are using your content by outmetrics. This is an alternative metric, not a citation, but is how people are citing your paper on social media, for example. There is a, already a metric called outmetric that it's possible to track how people are reading uh, your paper on blogs, on Wikipedia, on Mendeley, and other social media. Identify social interest uh, topics. So not everything that we do is interesting for public, for the public. You should try identifying, okay, this has a social interest or should be of social interest. And so try to identify what is interesting to be online, to be communicated. It strengths uh, social media bonds. So social media is about connecting with people. So using a picture, a GIF, video is always good to engage people. Otherwise, people won't just pass by their timeline and they won't care. They won't read your post. 
So try to engage with people, to be more informal, to be interesting. Use hashtags, tag people, institutions, groups, so you make sure that the algorithm of Facebook won't throw it to a group that you're not uh, interested. So if it's something that may interest um, universities, tag universities or groups or so societies. Contact the communication staff or, of your institution. If you have something interesting, try to send to the journalists or the PR of your university, your group, your department. So you don't need to be the journalist. You can just facilitate the journalist's work by making them know about your work and be available for interviews. It seems obvious, but it's not. I show a group of uh, Brazilian scientists at the beginning. One of them is Mayana Zatz. She works with stem cells in, at uh, University of Sao Paulo. And some people criticize Mayana to be too much exposed to media, right? Vanity, whatever. But Mayana is very, um, she's, she's available all the time for journalists. She provides her mobile phone. So if the journalists need something uh, for tomorrow and journalists don't have much time to, to, to have your feedback, they just call Mayana Zatz directly. Mayana, can you provide me some comments about the paper? Ah, okay, I'll do it. So it's a good way is being available. Um, let me see. I, I won't talk about... Ah, gee, I forgot. It's not here. Okay, but I'll mention anyway. Uh, there is a, um, um, a group, um, a project, an international project that is gathering uh, women scientists all over the world to be a reference for journalists. So as Brazilians, there are more than 200 Brazilian uh, scientists, women scientists in this, on this map. Uh, it's called 500, do you know? 500, thank you. 500 uh, women scientists, it should be called 5,000, 5 million, right? Because it's already much bigger than 500. Only in Brazil, 208 women scientists. So you can register your name. You are there on the map by field, by institution, by region, by country. And a journalist has no excuses not to find a women scientist for their pieces. So I think it's a very good strategy to avoid those, those commentaries that, okay, men are more, are easier to find, they are more available. So you have a project um, um, that motivates people to find uh, their reference. So I strongly recommend this project. So, Altmetrics, I'll pass, and I'll just thank you so much. Thank you, Germana. So we have time for questions. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, just two questions, comments um, about archive, but the papers and bioarchive, what do you think, if it's good? And then these 500 uh, scientific women can also be used to invite women for conference or something like that to search for that? Okay. Uh, and this is a very good point. I think Nature um, published um, a commentary last month, I think, about the main, co main friends. The strong presence of men in conference. And I think all, all of us, either men or women, we, we have a very important role to pinpoint that the open sections, the plenary sections, the most important sections are usually uh, led by men. And this is something that uh, we, are, as a, as a, we are always uh, being 
It's something that I, I don't tolerate anymore. It's something that I always pinpoint how, how much men are present in conferences. I was one of the organizers of, um, in 2014, uh, very important, I think, one of the most important conferences of science communication in the world, PCST, Public Communication of Science and Technology. I'm part of the scientific uh, member uh, committee and our goal was to have a very gender balanced conference from beginning to the end because any the other editions they 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 didn't care about that and it's always the same old white european man so we changed that and i think we we can always try to to consider that so i think it was a very good observation sorry <laughs> Uh, uh, Germana, uh, thank you for your presentation. Well, I'm a journalist too, and um, I don't know if it's a, I know it's not a question, but it's a commentary. And I think it's really sad that um, the field, the journalism field, is very narrow about diversity. Um, as you presented here, um, we presented ju you presented just uh, uh, white women as science communicators. I was at an event of uh, Serra Pileira Institute, Institute, and it was really shocking and sad. I can I can say that they gathered. Um, I think. All the, all the scientific journalists of the mainstream media in Brazil, and there, is, there was uh, no black journalist. And uh, I just want to point out that we have um, black female scientists that they communicate science. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is uh, Ana Carolina, she's funded by Instituto Serra Pilheira, and she has a channel in YouTube about uh, co um, what computing. What is her last name? Ana Carolina da Hora. And we have two professors um, in, at UFBA that they, they do this, uh, this job, um, Barbara Carini, she has an uh, Instagram page that is called uh, Descolonizando Saberes. It's really very interesting. And we have an um, architecture professor at UFBA, uh, Gabriela Gaia. Mm -hmm. And she has a podcast, um, Desembranquecendo a Cidade, that she... Uh, mm -hmm. She gave information about um, uh, Bahia and other other places about territory and and uh, well, I think I I, I uh, confess that I, I gave up journalism because I think it's it's really it's, re it's really tough for us that are not uh, white. Um, to have a place and to um, even to to um, to own the narrative. I think mm -hmm. in journalism we we have this. I know now that I'm I'm not I'm not the the one who will own the narrative, and it's really and I think journalists has to reflect about sure. it. Sure. Sure. Uh, because I, well, I'm um, I, um, I'm doing a master's degree in history of science, and I I'm coming to a conclusion that um, they just invite black female scientists to, to talk, talk about, about race, not to talk about their research. Yes, and I think and and the and the white and sometimes. Women, Women they, scientists they as well. They can speak yeah. about everything, mm -hmm. even about their research. And yeah. I think that journalists has to think about it. Yeah. Because it's it's really it's uh, for me. Yeah. 
sure. uh, it's uh, it's uh, it it makes the the field very poor. Yeah, you know, and and we are in Brazil. We have this. We have indigenous people. We have black people. Absolutely. And we yeah. have a lot of things to say. Absolutely. And and these women, they have their research that are as valuable as white sci white scientists sure. so they have to i think we have to 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 communicate that yeah oh thank you so much for your comment and i do uh i do think that we have lots of challenges for science communication i decided not to bring all that because I know how complex and how important it is to talk about uh, race and color and class and regions in Brazil. It's like so many things. And I decided to bring gender because I think it's a wide, wider group because the still gender is something that it's too difficult and we're still a minority. And of course, if you go to more uh, specificities uh, and color, it's majority of Brazil, and we face the difficulties. Um, we, we are starting now a project with um, native students, native Brazilian students in my university, the Indians, um, that again, is another group, very important group. And so w we need to have, actually, we need to have thousands of projects. And I think that Serra Pigueira, it's providing a good chance to, I think, to broaden the, the, the topics and the actors. Because lots of people uh, didn't have a chance because you had to go to the traditional way of, asking for support. And Serra Pilheira is providing support to people that originally didn't have a chance to get support. And I think they are already um, worried of having a more multiple, starting, of course, starting. It's always the word. I agree with you, there are lots to do. Um, and some some analysis shows that lots of women scientists are also, when they're a source of information of journalists, they usually talk about maternity, about the difficulties, the challenge of being a woman in science. So you see that they're not there just to talk about their research again, but about the challenge of being a woman in the field, which I think is important as well. But we, we need to have a role as a scientist. So I think it's something we should be, we should all be concerned about that, and mainly us that are the ones deciding um, how the round tables will be composed, how we are selecting projects. We should bear in mind that this is very important, what you're selling. Hi, well, this is more of a comment, not a question. Uh, so about the 500 women scientists uh, we have here, like two, so it three, <laughs> so we are four. Three? <laughs> oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, let me finish that. Um, so the, the way it is organized is like with pods, so like places around the world. And what I was going to say, and I know that we have two uh, pod coordinators here. I don't know if we have. So you are, yeah, so three, four. And your pod co coordinator as well? well the yeah. two of you? Okay, so we have three pod coordinators here. Um, and everyone is invited to uh, find the pod that's like from your state. And if it doesn't have one, you can create a pod. And if you are in Bahia, I, if you are in Bahia, you know, I suggest <laughs> you to, <laughs> to join the Bahia pod, which I coordinate the Bahia pod. And, and yeah, that's it. So that about the, the women's science. And the reason I actually uh, opened the pod, which I replied to that questionnaire, is because I didn't see any black scientists in the Brazilian pods or co coordinating the pods. And then 
uh, as uh, Eloa was bringing, I think that's an important question. And every time we talk about uh, gender in science, uh, not every time, many times the, the race part is um, erased and by choice, as, as you said, like it was my choice. So uh, we need to change this narrative sure. and it's a choice. So I also would say for you to tell, spread the word for other scientists that you may know and black scientists, for them to join the pods. Yeah. I have a question and a comment. My comment goes into the implications of professors being involved in social media. So in the evalua institutional evaluation of a professor, it's not very well seen. It's not very well seen, the fact that you spend time on social media. Mm -hmm. Even though it's, it's science communication, there are no indicators that will allow any authority uh, to create a performance evaluation for how, how is, what is the positive impact mm -hmm. for the university. So I think it's important to organize workshops that will create awareness among authorities. Mm -hmm. And my question goes to a new movement that is uh, coming up in the research editorials like Elsevier, Oxford, and other um, that I can list to you, but they want to create video clips of the research papers, specifically the abstracts. But my worry is, how is the copyright policies applied to any videos that will go into YouTube, specifically that are associated to research papers that have strict IP policies? C could you comment on that? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, because you know everything that is in there is public. But data and protocols and all the science uh, methods and methodologies applied there uh, must be covered and protected by IP. Yeah. I wouldn't know how to, to answer to that question. I know that there is even uh, some journals that are visual, right? So they may have a more, I don't know if it's restricted, uh, they have a restrictive uh, policy, copyright policy. Um, and have you considered the data, those visual abstracts? Yeah. That come from science? Yeah, lots of yeah, visual, visual abstracts are increasing a lot, mainly on medicine journals that they're using it. But I think the main, um, the aim of visual abstract is to reach uh, a wider uh, audience. So I don't think that copyright would be a problem because in this case it's just an abstract. So, but I don't know how, um, if it's like a visual paper, which uh, there is a, at least one journal that is visual, then I don't know how they're dealing with uh, copyright. But I know that in order to, um, to show some details that are not possible to show in written versions, they are filming the experiment and all the process to share, um, to try to avoid some, some errors. But I, I, I wouldn't know how to tell you about uh, copyrights in that sense. So we have one question there. So I will speak in Portuguese because I need to be fast. Uh, isso não é uma pergunta at all, é quase uma propaganda. É que assim, na astronomia, apesar da comunidade ser muito pequena, a gente tem desenvolvido atividades de divulgação em mídias sociais, como você falou, especialmente no Twitter. É, foi, eu acho que começou num, num dos anúncios de corte de verbas na educação, foi um pouco antes. É, nós levantamos uma hashtag, eu acho que alguém aqui comentou sobre hashtags, aquele joguinho da velha que a gente usa para identificar um certo tema, seja no Twitter, seja no Instagram. E era algo sobre como existe ciência no Brasil, minha ciência e um tweet, eram, eram coisas nesse, nesse tipo. E... Após isso, nós da astronomia resolvemos criar a AstroThread Brasil, BR, 
E consiste no Twitter, eu não sei se todo mundo tem acesso, mas no Twitter, como é, você tem um, um, um espaço muito limitado para escrever, são poucos caracteres, e às vezes você quer passar uma informação um pouco maior, você faz vários tweets e eles são ligados por um fio, então é a ideia da thread, uhum. e nós divulgamos informações, seja sobre tópicos que são assim, muito complexos, por exemplo, cosmologia, a gente tenta passar essa informação de uma forma simples para um público leigo e utilizando de ferramentas que você citou aqui, como imagens divertidas, GIFs, até memes, fazendo brincadeira com esse tipo de coisa para tornar o tema mais acessível para o público em geral. E isso tem dado muito certo. É, isso foi apresentado na última reunião da Sociedade é, Astronômica Brasileira. É, eles mostra, a gente mostrou um pôster, porque, na verdade, é, basicamente todo mundo que contribuiu para essas threads é, foi convidado a mandar uma foto sua para isso ser divulgado lá para a comunidade astronômica. E um fato muito interessante, eu não lembro de todos os números, mas uma coisa muito interessante é que todos os colaboradores que escreveram essas threads, isso tá, é, tem metade de homens fazendo isso e metade de mulheres. Então, é algo que até surpreendeu a gente que, por mais que na astronomia tenha uma representatividade feminina grande, mas a gente não esperava que isso também fosse refletido né, nesse tipo de iniciativa, de divulgação. Além disso, também tem o canal dos Astrotubers, que a Natasha aqui participa. É um canal no YouTube, vocês podem ir lá visitar, porque realmente é, é bem legal, é bem acessível. Todo mundo fala sobre temas... É, de difícil, de, de grande complexidade, então acho que é, é, é bem legal que isso seja divulgado. E, inclusive, como todos vocês estão falando sobre o Serra Pilheira, foi montado quase que um megazord de é, atividades de divulgação em astronomia e foi um dos projetos que foi convidado a, a participar do Serra Pilheira Camp, que aconteceu um, umas semanas atrás. Então, é, eu acho que é uma ferramenta fantástica o Twitter, o YouTube também tem se mostrado é, bem bom nesse sentido. E eu acho que é algo que todos nós devíamos fazer, especialmente nesse tempo que a gente está vivendo. Oh, é, desculpa. É, Para complementar a informação, okay. porque a gente faz isso junto. Mas... É, no Twitter, com o sucesso da AstroThread, outras, outras áreas começaram a fazer isso. Então, você também consegue achar a BioThread BR, a Física Thread BR. Então, assim, se vocês quiserem participar se unir como comunidade para fazer essas coisas. E como essas coisas dão trabalho também, a gente criou a Astro Mini BR, que é uma hashtag, que é mais fácil. É um único tweet, você joga uma curiosidade, uma informação, e aí Sim. o público costuma engajar e fazer várias perguntas. Então, assim, não toma tanto tempo. E eu convido todos a tentar. Então, se você pudesse postar para o nosso grupo Facebook, group, aqui você sabe que nós criamos isso, para que nós sabemos sobre o link. Então, uma última It's uh, one comment about uh, on Alba said uh, about the copyright. I think we, we should have in mind the difference between science communication and a science paper. Uh -huh. Once you write in a paid with a paywall uh, journal, they have to write about their your paper, your article, not about your science. So when you you want to make a video or, or a post or something like this. You are not like put in every word what you just written in your paper, but you explain what you're doing. So I, I there is a, a initiative around the world is coming to Brazil right now. It's called Go Fair Science, which the science should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, so everybody can uh, should. Uh, use your data to reply uh, to reuse and reuse it to 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 do a, another thing to have another look on your data and another kind of science and so on so it's not they are talking about this copyright issue mm -hmm. that we uh, carefully called copy left because you can yeah. you can use it <laughs> yeah. you, you should use it because you are communicating your science you are not rewriting the same paper and publishing in another uh, media. Uh, it's, 
it's your science, it's, it's the, yeah. the open access. They have the rights about on your paper, not on your science. But even if you think about the preprint, mm -hmm. that I mean, it's not, it hasn't gone through the peer review process, you can publish in, a, in another repository, so it's okay. So it's, that's yours, it's still yours. So even if you write a post uh, communicating about that paper, this is something that we usually do for a thesis or for a paper. And I, I think it's, I think it's every, every time I see that this is more commonly adopted by authors. They know that it doesn't matter if it's on a journal, if you don't spread the news on social media and on a blog or a video, um, there is a, le a smaller chance to be read. So I think for that there is no copy. I mean, the copy is yours. <laughs> the copyright is yours. So uh, I think we we will finish here. We thank Germana again, and we will be back. <laughs> <laughs>